Our guest today is the interim chief executive officer for the Chicago Public Schools. He was appointed just two months ago by Mayor Richard M. Daley. Our guest today will continue to serve as the president and CEO of the Chicago Community Trust. He led the design and implementation of the Trust's $50 million five-year commitment to supporting literacy, teacher and principal quality, and new school creation in Chicago. Our guest today earned his master's degree in anthropology and master's degree in business administration from the University of Arizona. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the City Club of Chicago, the Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Public Schools, Terry Mazzani. Terry? Thank you, Jay. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Now, we've had the Star Spangled Banner. We've had the opening session for the City Club season here. I heard an offer of free tickets for uh, Mr. Ricketts. I'm assuming those were Cubs tickets for the season that we had. Uh, so it does feel like pitchers and catchers are just weeks away for those of you who are avid baseball fans here. And we can hope for the Cubs once again. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge, and I figured out the way to pack the hall here, is to have multiple boards that you're serving as CEO. <laughs> it's a great strategy. So, so there are tables of my colleagues at the Chicago Community Trust that I want to thank for being here, and there are tables of my colleagues at the Chicago Public Schools uh, for that. And in particular, I've got several of my board members at the Trust, Frank Clark, Denise Gardner, Jack Greenberg, King Harris, and Jesse Ruiz that I want to thank you for accommodating this uh, bump in the road for the trust there. And I also want to recognize board members from the Chicago Public Schools, particularly Claire Mignana and Peggy Davis, uh, able to be here. And all of you in the room, because you have board affiliations recognize that this is the heart and soul of how Chicago works. It's all of the volunteer contributions of our board members for public service and civic leadership. So uh, just a round of applause for those of you who are board members in providing that service. <laughs> and I a debt of gratitude goes to Prue Beidler, who has also allowed me to do this. She was chair of the trust when I came to the Chicago Community Trust, at first as CEO, and she is now stepping in as, as chairman of the management committee and keeping the trust moving forward during this interim period. So thank you so much, Prue, for that. <laughs> so the fact that We've got a twofer here, Jay. I hope that that's allowed you to actually double the ticket price for this since they're getting two CEOs and one uh, for that and to help the bottom line a little bit uh, for that. Uh, and then you can imagine the toll that this has taken on my calendar and my schedule day to day. And so the person who is sacrificing the most during this interim while I undertake both jobs is my wife, Lottie, and I'm deeply in her debt for being here. So she is right up here. Uh, I feel a need to apologize to our state elected officials as I realize we're competing with the inaugural events, and given the packed house here, we probably put a dent in their attendance. Uh, my apologies for that. Uh, today, what I'm going to try to do, a feat never before attempted, is to talk cogently and coherently about global economics, philanthropy, and education, all in one 30-minute conversation. Uh, if I pull this off, I think I'm in line for a Toastmaster Awards. 
Uh, but just as likely you may witness the spectacular of an out of controlled speaker careening into the barricades of a NASCAR pileup. Uh, but, but isn't that why we watch NASCAR, right? It, it's not to see who finishes, it's to see who doesn't finish. Uh, And then just to elevate the degree of difficulty a little more, uh, I do recognize that I am momentarily a public figure in that everything I, can, I say today can and will be used against me. Uh, I'm terrified that it's on tape here and will go up on the City Club's website uh, in perpetuity here. Uh, but onward, let me plunge fearlessly into this trio of topics uh, for that. And with the PowerPoint that I'm going to use here, uh, my deepest thanks go to uh, Michelle Martin and Kate Algeyer, who worked tirelessly on short order to have this come about, and really appreciate that. So this story begins, begins first with the research that we undertook at the Chicago Community Trust. And it's from this, as we were resetting our strategic plan and looking a decade out, a decade, the midpoint of which will be marked by our centennial of this institution. Uh, but I believe that we're at the threshold of a prolonged period of change and that we need to be about the business of coming to grips with a range of very serious decisions in the next decade. Emerging from the Great Recession, we've entered an era of uncertainty and transformation characterized by J. Walker Smith of the Futures Company as the era of consequence, dominated by increased complexity and disruption that has the feel of a historical inflection point, an inflection point that may last a decade or more, but nevertheless, a time that represents a fundamental reordering of global economics, interconnection and interdependency, an era of increasing scarcity as seemingly abundant resources become in short supply, climate change and environmental degradation that extract a greater social and economic cost on our society, growing disparities in access and opportunity, driving an increasing drag on social problems, on social advancement and improvements in the quality of life. In this era of consequence, Consumers in particular, us, will be focused on responsibility, vigilance, resourcefulness, prioritization, and our networks. Uh, McKinsey and Company has published similar research called Shape in the Future and identified five transformative trends. The great rebalancing, productivity imperative, pricing the planet, the global grid, and the market state. And IBM looked at capitalizing on complexity, <clears throat> and they're the trends, creativity, dexterity, and reinvention. Well beyond our control, we're clearly on a collision course with the future, and this to me feels like a slow motion train wreck playing out in front of us, short term pain that will be measured in years, longer term trauma that will span decades. Globally, we are entering an era of massive change. Currently, the world's population of 6.8 billion people, of the 6.8 billion people, 1 billion consume 80% of the world's resources. <clears throat> Between 1965 and 2002, the G7 countries represented here generated 67% of the global GDP. What's changed and what is continuing to change, first the G7 became the G20. I don't know if you, kind of all of a sudden it was just there. We had decade of G7, G7, and then boop, we've got the G20. And based on World Bank research, there's your G20. Between now and 2050, the world's population will increase from 6.8 billion people to 9 billion people but only 100 million of that increase will be in the G7 countries. There will be 8 billion people in the developing world. China and India will produce 50% of the world GDP at that point in time. Two-thirds of the world, 
middle class will be found in developing countries by the year 2030. And although our standard of living will increase, the median income going up to about $100,000, India and China will both see increases to about 30 or $40,000 as their median income. But times three or four billion people, that's a huge number. It's the power of large numbers there. At the same time, two billion Africans will be living in poverty. Uh, we as a country are on a trajectory to continue to slip in the percent of our contribution to global GDP. So we have China and India, and we have Brazil and Russia as part of the BRIC countries here, uh, recognizing the shift in economic power. And so you can see that even within the span of the last five years, that global GDP continues to increase for these developing countries, and our share continues to decrease uh, for that. That trend only continues forward. Those of you working with your investment bankers all know, put the dollars in the emerging markets funds. That's where the information comes from. So the implications of this are, with the demographics, are increasing resource scarcity in food, water, and energy, and that drives the trend that Mackenzie identified of pricing the planet. Costs will only go up from there. Now, as a result, how we get along with the rest of the world will matter, and how we get along with ourselves will matter. So consistent with McKenzie's trend analysis, our world is becoming a competitive landscape of market states organized around economic productivity. And that productivity is located in the metros. Brookings Institution has been a partner with the city for several years and has formulated a powerful model to reignite the competitiveness of this country around a set of powerful levers that are the opportunity-rich, low-carbon, innovation-fueled, and export-focused levers that are, are key to regaining our economic footing in the world. And then, fully recognizing these trends, the Chicago Community Trust has been working with the MacArthur Foundation over the last year, and I really want to thank my colleague Julie Stash for her great partnership on that. And we've been working with the Mayor's Office, Metropolis 2020, World Business Chicago, the London School of Economics, and the Alfred Herrhausen Society of Dosha Bank to host what happened in December, the Global Metro Summit. Uh, and it was a very important gathering of global leaders uh, developing strategies for metros to begin to revitalize their economies. And out of that, what we see is the future is high tech, the future is green, the future is digital, and the future is smart. Uh, just green alone has the potential and promise as we build a sustainable economy of generating over two million new jobs. Our challenge is how do we get those jobs to be created here? But as we seek to regain our momentum and leadership on the global stage and our competitive edge, we will need a serious reordering of our national, state, and local priorities. And you can see where we have dropped just in terms of the production of engineering graduates, uh, 45th in the ranking of countries. And of the new entrance into the workforce, uh, recognizing that we're living in an era where you have to have post-secondary education, and the fact that well over 50% of the new uh, entrance into the workforce will be African-American or Latino, and yet fewer than 20% of African-American and Latino students advance to college and succeed in college. Uh, this is going to create a severe skills gap in our workforce in the decades to come, and it's imperative that we turn this around and get this right. 
And to give you an example of this journey, and this is work from the OECD uh, and Andres Schleicher, I'm stealing his slides directly, but I think he's okay with that. Uh, he's got a great set of showing our progress as a country relative to other countries in terms of the production of, of higher education degrees. And you can see we look pretty good here at this point, leading in, this was only 15 years ago. Today, we're spending more money but getting less results, and we have been passed by a whole flock of countries uh, moving here. And this goes to the heart of our problem. Uh, work related to this is what Carol Collada has been doing with CEOs for Cities. And that's identifying the economic return for investment in higher education and a strategy for city vitality called city dividends that looks at the talent dividend, the green dividend, and the opportunity dividend. And I'm highlighting specifically the talent dividend where you can see the impact that having post-secondary education has on opportunities for employment, as well as the wages that a person is able to earn. So these global and macro trends drive and map onto the realities and prospects of metropolitan Chicago as a global city. If we weren't a global city, what I just shared with you would not be all that pressing and relevant, but we are. And we were looking at this from the philanthropic sector and how we could help to contend with these forces. Uh, the recently released plan of the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for planning the Go2040 plan, I hope that all of you have a copy of that and have at least perused it. Uh, in that plan, we're projecting that our seven county region will grow by 2.8 million people. We know that we will be more dense and diverse, and the choices we make now will determine whether we experience enhanced quality of life or a deteriorating one. So we will need to rethink everything that is based upon our fossil fuel uh, economy, our relationship to cars, to road building, food production, the distribution system, our land use and buildings. Uh, and unfortunately, perhaps the greatest threat that we face right now is the financial condition of the state of Illinois with the current projection of a $15 billion deficit and the $160 billion in unfunded pension obligations has caused the state to make severe cuts in human services and those who are least able to bear the brunt of those. At the Chicago Community Trust, in looking at this plan, the CMAP plan and the changes, we just completed our comprehensive strategic planning process. And that's something as a community foundation, we periodically assess the most pressing needs of our community and develop grant priorities to address those needs. Uh, and this was developed within the context of the economic conditions that we see characterized by a prolonged period of no or slow growth, reduced public funding of basic needs and services, including education, less reliance on the government for, our, for funding our solutions, persistent high unemployment, particularly among minority populations, rising poverty rates, impacting communities unevenly, uh, projected economic insecurity for many, including those currently working, a continued high rate of foreclosures, communities burdened by foreclosed properties, and the need for innovation and new ideas to address these problems. So, so what, what we took at is recognizing our starting point is Chicago as a global city, and for it to be economically prosperous would then be the basis for us to impact all of the other strategies. And then based on that, we identified a, 
important shift in how we go about our business, moving from being a responsive institution that would receive uh, proposals, the quaint old saying is over the transom, uh, and we do have some transoms here in the room for those of you not familiar with transoms, uh, but to one that is proactive and strategy-based focusing on a set of outcomes uh, for that. And so it is the basis of the CMAP plan and then the Metro Pulse indicators that are also online that give us an opportunity to bring together and align a lot of things that we're doing as a metropolitan region around a common set of objectives and a common set of measures for those sorts of things, our measures of education, health, public safety, those types of things are being captured and cataloged, a series of 200 measures behind these 11 metrics that are, uh, are the categories that are displayed up here. And so I encourage all of you to look at that. We've provided in your folders at your table uh, information about our work and the CMAP uh, Metro Pulse indicators there. It'll be easily accessible on the web and an opportunity to drill down in minute detail to specific communities and to compare and contrast different data sets uh, within that. Because we recognize that the challenges that we have to uh, approach are about economic development, sustainability, education and workforce development, violence prevention, healthy lifestyles, broadband access, I'll get to that more later, transit and government efficiency and integrity. Now for education. The implication of these global realities are enormous for our system of public education and our public schools. And this goes way beyond any sense that our schools may be bad or failing. And I will assert today that that is not the right way to define the problem. And in fact, it only makes matters worse and hinders our improvement. When thinking about school reform, it's helpful to understand that our country has been engaged in school reform for the past hundred years or even longer. So as urgent and unique as these times feel, it's not really anything new. That's been the character of our country uh, for that. And if you look at you know, the data sets that flow frequently in the newspapers here and other reports, uh, the challenge is not so much that our schools are failing because they are demonstrably more effective than they were 20 years ago. The problem, as I showed in the OECD slides, is other countries have gotten better faster and are leaving us behind uh, for that. And so, so our challenge is to actually help schools accelerate their rate of improvement and to get the right schools for the time we live in. Essentially, we're going to need to leapfrog a generation of school reform uh, so our task is not so much continuous improvement now, but the true reimagining of teaching and learning uh, for that. And I'll give a basis for why I say that in a few minutes here. But I traced the modern era of school reform back to 1983 with the publication of at Nation at Risk. And it may be a little tedious, but I want to spend time on some of the premises that are argued in this report. Um, because they say very important things that have a different context today. So it starts with, our nation is at risk. Our once unchallenged preeminence in commerce, industry, industry science, and technology innovation is being overtaken by competitors throughout the world. Uh, this was in 83 that they were saying that. So then, we look at you know, what was once unimaginable a generation ago has begun to occur. Others are matching and surpassing our education attainments. 
And then this notion of committing the unthinkable of generally educational unilateral disarmament uh, for that. And then there was the classic case that if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. So that was pretty strong language back in 83. <clears throat> and then through this process, they start to talk about this larger global context of history is not kind to idlers. And in looking ahead as the world is indeed one global village and the fact that we were at one point able to secure the prosperity of this country when only a few went on to higher education. Historically, it's been about 20% who have led that. In this process, they talk about the risk is not only that the Japanese make automobiles more efficiently, then they talk about the South Koreans have built the world's most efficient steel mill. And all. The languages, Japan and South Korea, they do not talk about China and India in 1983. And you know, that was just at the start of the glimmers of the opening up of China and its economic de uh, development at that point in time. But that trend was missed in a nation at risk. So the fact that they missed it and it has such major importance to what we're doing. It, they did capture right the information age and think about the personal computer you had in 1983. Uh, did you? I had a K-Pro. Uh, we had Ataris back then in our public schools. Uh, those sorts of things. But they got that at this information age we are entering uh, for that. And then the sense of needing a high level of education as essential to our pluralism and individual freedom. And if you think about how our society seems to be fraying not only at the edges but at its core at times, uh, I will talk about why I think that some of the things we've been doing in our education system have, have gone contrary to this statement right there. And it's this classic Thomas Jefferson quote that underpins all of this. I know no safe depository of the ultimate powers of society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion. This is the basis of public education in our country. Uh, and from a nation at risk, uh, moves on, this uh, magazine cover, 1992, corporations, David Kearns, we're going to save our schools. Uh, I think we got mission accomplished, checked off on that one. Thank you, David. And then here, the canary in the coal mine, 1997, looking at the achievement gap uh, and you know, pres uh, presaging the problems that we we're having there. These were all the driving forces in play when a nation at risk was, I, I'm sorry, when No Child Left Behind was penned. But unfortunately now, a decade into that, I think we're paying the price for an education system that, a policy structure that looked at schools as failing and only needed a strong system of accountability and a quick response to the lowest performers, which was to take them out, fire the bad teachers, close the failing schools, get rid of the bad principals, and ignoring the 80 to 90% of the education system that was good and moving from good to great. 
So we've spent a decade focused on the bottom performing. For those of you involved in organizations, if you're trying to improve performance, you've got to take good and move it to great. We miss that with this. Uh, there's that saying that what gets measured gets done. It's exactly what we got with No Child Left Behind. There's another saying, country saying that you can't fatten a chicken by weighing it. Uh, but that's exactly what we we're trying to do. So, so I, I said, how do I make this point? And so I've, I've got an analogy here. You're the first audience to see this. Let's see if it'll work. Uh, but let's imagine that the leaders at Ford or GM decided that the most important thing about building a new car was that it had wheels, right? Because it can't drive out of the assembly line without wheels, so it's got to have wheels. And so they decide, we're just going to measure performance in terms of the number of wheels that a car had. <laughs> hmm. Pretty fancy, R. <laughs> it, it, these are a tribute to Kate Algeyer, whose mastery, I don't know how she created these slides, but to me they're, they're priceless. So unfortunately with No Child Left Behind, we did exactly that. And some of my colleagues said, well, if we just painted math and reading on all of these wheels, we would get the notion of what No Child Left Behind it. We so narrowed the curriculum focus that we lost the essence of our education system. We've traded off our pursuit of excellence for the tyranny of accountability. If, on the other hand, we think about schools as needing to improve, not needing to be closed, then we focus the system's resources on support and development. So what should we be doing? I'll lay out four basic things that I would stress. First, we have to begin with world-class standards. And this brings us full cycle to the opening part of my speech. Our competition is global, so we have to have these standards, and they are not measured by standardized tests about math and science knowledge. It's bigger than that. It's the complex represented by algebra at eighth grade. Our advanced placement courses are the international baccalaureate uh, programs that Chicago has been building in a number of, of schools. And then looking more broadly, it's how do we think about what we're trying to achieve. We want young people to become powerful thinkers, that they are able to use critical and creative thinking skills to solve problems for artistic expression, to work independently and collaboratively, to apply their skills to making decisions that affect their lives now and in the future. We want them to be responsible citizens that value and participate in a democratic and culturally diverse society. We are culturally diverse. If you don't get that training in your schools, then we're going to have problems as a country being cohesive. They've got to be competent in interpersonal and social skills. Uh, they've got to be able to develop supportive relationships, network with each other, interact with an society, accept responsibility for themselves, accept responsibility for their environment. We also need young people to be self-confident individuals who have a positive self-concept exhibiting motivation, self-sufficiency, students who are flexible and adaptable, who make educational choices about their behavior which supports physical, mental, emotional, and social well-being. And we've got to have effective literate communicators. It's not just that you read, but you're reading for a purpose. It's just not that you talk, but you're able to communicate complex messages effectively. And you'll tell me later if I succeeded in that today, or whether or not I need to go back to school. But it's working verbally, non-verbally, written, kinesthetic, visual, auditory, musical, logical mathematical communications, these sorts of things, the broad range, and throughout that 
that's where we need a full and broad comprehensive curriculum. We've got to move back to arts front and center in our curriculum, social studies front and center. That's where you learn about economics, geography, civics. Those are the things that have to be part of the core curriculum of the institution and accessible by every student. We also need to then, the third point is investing in the preparation of teachers and principals. We have got a lot of talent in the Chicago public schools. It is breathtaking, the capacity of teachers and principals and district leaders in our system there. But it takes ongoing development uh, for these individuals. They've got to be able to have the time and opportunity to collaborate. Teaching is a joint construct. It doesn't occur individually by isolated teachers who close their classroom doors. It's a collective enterprise of the entire institution. And when we talk about rewards for that, we have to look at how do we reward the collective as well as the individual high achievers uh, for that. And for our principalship, we need to move away from the Tayloristic view of the top management with the brain and the bottom doer workers who are mindless, that cannot be our conception of public education. We have to recognize that teachers are vital thinkers, creative, engaged participants in the very process of education for that. And so that means building in distributed leadership roles where teachers can aspire to leadership ranks without having to become a principal but they can become a coach or a mentor, a lead teacher. They can become a curriculum specialist or expert in their school and bring more knowledge there. Principals in opportunity, we train way too many principals in the state right now. It's a, a waste of resources there. We need to move more to a medical model where it's very challenging to get in, very challenging to complete, and things like the UIC program for principal preparation three-year practicum, it takes that amount of time to develop the full array of skills and knowledge that you need as an education leader of a school site for all of that. And then with differentiated instruction, we've got to broaden that. If we want virtually all students able to go to post-secondary education, then we're in a situation where we can't just teach to the top 20% but in fact, we have to teach more broadly to that. And then this, the role of technology, okay. getting nervous up here. <clears throat> with, with the role of technology, it's not a computer in every classroom in a sense. It, it goes way beyond that. And here again, looking to the partnership with the MacArthur Foundation and the Chicago Public Schools on what they've done with digital media and learning is really path-breaking for that. Focusing on how young people learn, socialize, communicate, play, and participate in civic life in a way that, because the digital world means that young people are now interacting, exploring, experimenting, producing new content in ways we never did at school. If you think about the old graphing exercise in your science class or something where you would be looking at taking your pulse, then you'd jump up and down, you'd take your pulse again and you'd plot it on a graph, but you spent the entire class period plotting the graph, Nowadays, you put your finger on a little sensor, and you're doing that, and the, the computer is creating the graph for you. So you're getting to ask the higher order questions of what causes that change in my pulse rate. So all of a sudden, young people have transformed to an entirely different dimension of learning than what we experienced in our growing up here. In this slide in particular, is an example of what I mean by technology infused. This is a slide that was embedded in an email sent to a parent about the parent's child and performance in preschool. Every parent has a login address box where they are able to get electronic updates about that, but not just written communication, in this case visual evidence that 
their child participated in an activity, a description of this activity, this was involving prediction. The classic, does it float or not float? You know, sure, David Letterman thinks that he coined that one, but no, in fact, it was our preschool teachers who have been doing that long before David Letterman. It's a fundamental understanding of a young child who's starting to understand the physical world around them in developing the mental constructs for something like floating. So here is a case where then uh, the child was asked, you know, is this floating or not? And this child said, yeah, my block is on top of the water. It floats. All of a sudden, as a parent, wouldn't you love to have access to this? Not just the teacher saying, yeah, your child participated actively today, but visual demonstration of that participation, what the concept attainment was in that participation, and how they succeeded in that. It's an extraordinarily powerful tool. To do this, every parent in Chicago has to have internet access, which is why the broadband strategy of the Chicago as the city that networks is so vital that we get right. And again, we're falling behind other countries on an investment in core infrastructure that Hardy Bott, he is here someplace, envisioned as the same as a water pipe into your house, or natural gas, or electricity, fiber for broadband connectivity needs to be part of that basic bundle of common services to every household. Otherwise, we will leave large swaths of our city behind in this activity. And then we've got to focus on the developmental transitions uh, from early childhood is actually absolutely essential. The middle grades, where young people are developing an identity external to themselves. And then high school, where we're providing a clear transition straight to post-secondary education. To do these four things will cost money. And Yet the school system has just experienced a round of brutal budget cuts. And we cannot repeat that level of cuts and still have a thriving organization. Staying even cannot be the new normal for growing. Otherwise, we're going to perpetuate the conditions of public education described almost 20 years ago in a nation at risk. Do we really want this to be our legacy? So let me conclude then with a quote that I think gets this right. Uh, and this is thanks to my association with Chris Kennedy and him joining the board of the Chicago Community Trust. But to me, it's a very powerful statement. And this is from Robert F. Kennedy. And he said this in a speech in 1968, March, that he delivered at the University of Kansas. He says, too much and too long we seem to have surrendered community excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product, if we should judge America by that, counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for those who break them. It counts the destruction of our redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and the cost of a nuclear warhead and armored cars for police who fight the riots in our streets. It counts Whitman's rifle and Speck's knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet, our gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything, in short, except that, which makes life worthwhile, and it tells us everything about America except why we are proud that we are Americans. We have some difficult choices to make ahead of us. The decisions that we do make matter. I want us to think about these young people who are cheering us on to do the right thing. 
So if we can all give our schools a big collective hug, I would appreciate that very much during my tenure with the Chicago Public Schools. Thank you for allowing me this time today. Uh, thank you, Terry. Okay, we have um, time for um, several questions. So if you have a uh, question for Mr. Mazzani, just hold it up. We've got staff members who are circulating about. They will pick them up and uh, bring them to the front. <coughs> Meanwhile, we have a few questions to get us started. <coughs> you didn't plant uh, Hardy over here, did you, to ask a question? I, I did. Okay. I did. Thank you, Hardy, for coming through. One of, our, one of our former speakers, so we always give uh, him a break. Uh, his question is, and Hardik, by the way, is now with <coughs> Cisco Systems, little plug there. Uh, with huge issues facing our national, state, municipal budgets and limited funds, what is the top one accomplishment that you are targeting? Yeah, I I actually have five main accomplishments during my tenure, uh, one of which is to, to focus on streamlining and rationalizing our organization structure within the public schools. Second is to refresh the district's education plan. Then third is to resolve our budget uh, with the least harm to our schools and our classrooms. Uh, fourth is on the legislative agenda. There are a number of proposals that are flying fast and furious for that. And the fifth is our labor relations. It's vital that we have a positive, constructive relationship with the Chicago Teachers Union and the other bargaining units of the district. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hardy actually asked two questions, but only one to customer here, Hardy. <coughs> but yours blends in <coughs> with a <the> question <coughs> excuse me, asked by Joyce Saxon, a member of our Board of Governors. After all of your great on-the-job experiences, would you be a candidate to become the permanent head of CPS? And do you expect to have input on the choice of who that person is who becomes permanent? I, I think she's denying that one. Yeah, that, uh, that, that decision is... <laughs> I said it was Hardy's question. I gave you a, it's a combined question. You know synthesis? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, that's clearly not my decision to make or tender at all. Uh, my board has been generous in loaning me till June 30th uh, for that. And I do hope that I have the opportunity to work with the next mayor and to be able to provide some continuity for the next leadership of the public schools. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is from uh, Jim Aldworth. Uh, Jim, where are you? Ah, he's in the rear. He's with the Chicago Fire Department, one of our great firefighters. God bless them all. If the smart money is being invested in brick countries and coastal U.S. cities, where will the venture capital needed to hire and inspire Chicago students come from? Pretty darn good question. Thanks, Jim. That is a, a really insightful question. One of the things that the public schools is blessed with is the great partnerships, both civic and philanthropic that we have, and, uh, as well as corporate, and I would hope that those continue. I know that the Civic Committee has been very passionate about its support for education and new schools, uh, for instance, and, and I want to be supportive of that. We do have Barbara Lumpkin here, who is uh, the head of our, our partnership activity and external relations for that, and I think we can continue to work in that vein to identify opportunities where the human and financial capital from uh, those of you in your organizations can be applied in meaningful ways to extend the school day, enrich the learning opportunities for our children. Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> this is from Charles Benton from the Benton Foundation. Charles, where are you at? Okay, right up here. His question is, what is the role of new technology especially broadband and the internet in addressing our economic and community challenges. 
Yeah. Charles, I believe that's been asked and answered uh, during the presentation. Uh, it, it, it's absolutely vital. When I talked about the leapfrog that we, we have to make, uh, it goes to the notion framed by the MacArthur research that schools are one node of learning and that we have to be able to create these opportunities in our public libraries, uh, which under Mayor Daley have expanded in an extraordinary number and fashion throughout our communities, but we've got to bring it into the households. Uh, we have to create venues like U Media for young people to engage with positive peer relationships and adult mentoring and tutoring for this. Uh, that is the secret for us being able to move beyond our current state of education. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Linda, uh, Mr. Mazzani will meet with the media people afterwards, so in fairness to all the other media people here, I'm not going to ask your question, but you'll get a chance to ask it uh, afterwards. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions here, and then we'll wrap things up, the prerogative of the moderator. Um, in talking about the preparation of teachers and principals, who frequently, to those of us in the general public, seem to be easy targets for critics of um, our public education system, and in a system where a, a large number of teachers leave before their third year, how will you go about raising the morale of the people on the front lines? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question. Was that the last question? Uh, or yeah. you got one more? I may have one more. Oh, okay. Uh, because it, it's, a, it's a good one to close on, but is recognize that that the key for improving education begins at home with parents as the first teachers. And it's really important that we provide that preparation and support because we have many households where it's very challenging and difficult for parents, guardians, grandparents to fulfill that role. And it's like at the trust we support a group called Grand Families that uh, is providing that type of support and even respite for grandparents raising children, circumstances that they may not have expected. But then next to that, the research demonstrates over and over again that the biggest impact on student achievement is the classroom teacher. And that is where we need the biggest investments. And we have to recognize that it is a very hard and challenging job in this circumstance, it's important that given the burnout rate, uh, have a son who at three years into the profession also experienced that burnout, uh, but is still within education looking at issues of how to move more young people to and through college. Uh, but there, that's where it's the investment in the additional leadership opportunities. It's the investment in collaboration. When we talk about the short school day for the Chicago Public School students, it's not just about the instructional time. It's also about the time for teachers to work collaboratively on the curriculum on addressing student issues, needs, and concerns. And so that day needs to expand, not just for more in-class instructional opportunities, but for teacher preparation and collaboration time. If we provide opportunities like that, it'll be more rewarding for teachers for that. And to recognize that, that for teachers, although it seems counterintuitive and people may not own up to it, is the biggest motivator for teachers is not pay. It's the sense of efficacy of making a difference for that, uh, for what they do in the classroom. And so it's that fueling that, creating these different alternative career ladders so that a teacher after three years can then invest in a professional development program that gives them exam advanced certification as a reading specialist, a math specialist, things like that. They're able to move into positions of more responsibility and authority within the school. They're able to move up into department chair positions and other leadership opportunities. That's how we can help to uh, keep individuals who are investing their careers in public education. 
Thank you, Terry. And that was our last question. Let's give Terry Mazzani a round of applause.